Okay. And read us on in. King Lear, Act 1, Scene 1. King Lear's Palace. Enter Kent, Gloucester, and Edmund. I thought the king had made more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. It did always seem so to us, but now in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most. Is not this your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that now I am brazen to it. <laughs> I cannot conceive you. Uh, sir, this young fellow's mother could. Whereupon she grew round wombed and had indeed, sir, a son for her cradle ere she had a husband for her bed. Do you smell a fault? I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have, sir, a son by order of law, some year elder than this, who yet is no dearer in my account. Though this knave came something saucily into the world before he was sent for. Yet was his mother fair. There was good sport at his making. And the whore son must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. My lord of Kent. Remember him hereafter as my honorable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and sue to know you better. Attend Attend on. On. Yeah, go ahead, read on. Well, attend the Lords of France and Burgundy Gloucester. I shall, my liege. Right. Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Give me the map there. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our first intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we, unburdened, crawl towards death. <laughs> the princes, France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court, have made their amorous sojourn, and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you shall we say doth love us most? That we our largest bounty may extend, when nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril, our eldest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than words can wield the matter, dearer than eyesight, space, and liberty. Beyond what can be valued, rich or rare, no less than life, with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as child e'er loved or father found. A love that makes breath poor and speech unable. Beyond all manner of so much, I love you. What shall Cordelia do? Love and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, we make thee lady to thine and Albany's issue. Be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan, wife to Cornwall? Speak. Sir, I am made of the self-same metal that my sister is, and prize me at her worth. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love. Only she comes too short, that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys, and find I am alone felicitate and your dear highness love. And poor Cordelia, and yet not so, since I am sure my love's more richer than my tongue. To thee and thine, hereditary ever, remain this ample third of our fair kingdom. Now, our joy, although the last, not least, 
what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak. Unhappy I that I am. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond. No more, nor less. Now how, Cordelia, mend your speech a little, lest it may mar your fortunes. Good, my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as our right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sister's husbands if they say they love you all? Happily, when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this? Aye, good, my lord. So young and so untender? So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth, then, be thy dower. Here I disclaim all my paternal care. Propinquity and property of blood. There's a stranger to my heart and me hold deeds from this forever. Barbarous Scythian are he that makes his generation's messes. The gorge's appetite shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied, and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. Good, my liege. Peace, Kent. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most, and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. Hence, and avoid my sight. So be my grave and my peace. As here I give. Her father's heart from her. Call France. Who stirs call Burgundy, Cornwall, and Albany with my two daughters' dowers digest this third. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Ourself by monthly course with reservation of a hundred knights, by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due turns. Only we shall retain the name and all the additions to a king. The sway, revenue, execution of the rest, beloved sons, be yours. If you confirm this coronet, Part betwixt you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honored as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as my great patron thought in my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. Let it fall, rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. What wilt thou do, old man? Thinkest thou that the duty shall have dread to speak when power to flattery bows? To plainness honored bound when majesty stoops to folly? Reverse thy doom, and in thy best consideration check the hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment, the youngest daughter does not love thee least. Clint, on thy life, no more. My life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thy enemies, nor fear to lose it, thy safety being the motive. Out of my sight. See better, Lear, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Oh, Basso, Miss Grant. Dear sir, forbear. Do, kill thy physician and the fee bestow upon the, thy foul disease, revoke thy doom. Hear me, Recreon, since thou hast sought to make us break our vow, which we durst never yet take thy reward. 
Five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from diseases of the world. And on the sixth, to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If on the tenth day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, the moment is thy death. Fare thee well, king. Sith thus thou wilt appear, freedom lives hence, and banishment is here. The gods to their dear shelter take thee, maid, that justly thinks and hast most rightly said. And your large speeches may your deeds approve, that good effects may spring from words of love. Thus Kent, O oh, princess, bids you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country new. Here's France and Burgundy, my noble lord. My lord of Burgundy, we first address toward you, who with this king hath rivaled for our daughter. What, in the least, will you require in present dower with her or cease? No question, love. Most royal majesty, I crave no more than what your highness offered, nor will tender less. Hmm? Right, noble Burgundy, when she was dear to us, we did hold her so, but now her price is fallen. Sir, there she stands, and nothing more may filthy, fitly, sorry, slip. Like your grace, she's there, and she is yours. I know no answer. Will you? With those infirmities she owes, take her or leave her. Pardon me, royal sir, election makes not up on such conditions. And leave her, sir. For by the power that made me, I tell you all her wealth. For you, great king, I would not, from your love, make such a stray to match you where I hate. This is most strange, that she even now is your best object, most best, most dearest, should in this trice of time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favor? Sure, her offense must be of such unnatural degree. I yet beseech your majesty. It is no vicious blot, murder, or foulness, no unchaste action or dishonored step that hath deprived me of your grace and favor. But even for want of that for which I am richer, a still soliciting eye, and such a tongue as I am glad I have not. Though not to have it hath lost me in your liking. Better thou hadst not been born, than not to have pleased me better. Is it but this? A, a tardiness in nature which often leaves the history unspoke that it intends to do? My lord of Burgundy, what say you to the lady? Will you have her? She is herself a dowry. A royal leader, give but the portion you yourself proposed, and here I take Cordelia by the hand, uh, Duchess of Burgundy. Nothing. I have sworn. I am firm. <sighs> I am sorry, then, you have so lost a father that you must lose a husband. Peace, peace be with Burgundy. Since that respects of fortune are his love, I shall not be his wife. Fairest Cordelia, that art most rich being poor, most choice forsaken and most loved despised, thee and thy virtues here I seize upon. Be it lawful, I take up what's cast away. Thy dowerless daughter, king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us, of ours, and our fair France. Not all the dukes and of waterish Burgundy can buy this unprized precious maid of me. Bid them farewell, Cordelia, though unkind. Thou losest there a better where to find. Thou hast her, France. Let her be thine. Therefore be gone without our grace, our love, our venison. Come, noble Burgundy. Bid farewell to your sisters. The jewels of our father, which washed eyes Cordelia leaves you. I know what you are, and like a sister am most loath to call your faults as they are named. 
Use well, our father. So farewell to you both. Prescribe not us our duties. Let your study be to content your Lord. Time shall unfold what plated cunning hides, who cover faults, at last shame them derides. Well, may you prosper. Come, my fair Cordelia. Sister, is it not a little I have to say of what most nearly appertains to us both? I think our father will hint tonight. That's most certain, and with you, next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is? The observation we have made of it hath not been a little. He always loved our sister most, and with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. Tis the infirmity of his age. Yet he hath never much known himself. The best and the soundest of his time hath been but rash. Then we must look to receive from his age the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric ears bring with them. Such unconstant starts are we like to have from him as this of kin's banishment. Pray you, let's hit together. If our father carry authority with such dispositions as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall think further on. Oh, we must do something and in the heat. Scene two, the Earl of Gloucester's castle. Enter Edmund with a letter. Thou, Thou nature, art my goddess. To thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother? Why bastard? Wherefore base? When my dimensions are as well compact my mind as generous and my shape as true as honest madam's issue. Why brand they us with base, with baseness, with bastardy? Well, then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my intention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. No, gods. Stand up for bastards. Kent banished thus, and France in color parted, and the king gone tonight, all this done upon the gad. Edmund, how now, what news? So please your lordship none. What paper were you reading? Mm, nothing, my lord. No, what needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir. Pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read, and for so much that I have perused, I find it not fit for your liking. Give me the letter, sir. Well, I hope. For my brother's justification, he wrote this but as an essay or taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. Come to me that of this I may speak more. If our father would sleep till I waked him, you should have half his revenue forever and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar, conspiracy, 
sleep till I waken him. You should enjoy half his revenue. My son, Edgar. Had he a hand to write this? A heart and brain to breed it in? When came this to you? Who brought it? Well, it was not brought to me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's? If the matter were good, my lord, I durst swear it were his. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. It is his hand, my lord. But I hope his heart is not in the contents. Have he never heretofore sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But I have oft heard him maintain it to be fit that sons at a perfect age and fathers declining, the father should be as ward to the son and the son manage his revenue. His very opinion in the letter. Mm -hmm. Go, Sarah, seek him. I'll apprehend him, abominable villain. Where is he? Do not well know, my lord. I dare pawn down my life for him, that he hath wrote this to feel my affection to your honor and to no further pretense of danger. I think you so. If your honor judge it in need, I will place you where you shall hear us confer of this. And then without any further delay than this very evening? He cannot be such a monster. Nor is not. His father that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Heaven and earth. Edmund, seek him out. Wind me into him, I pray you. I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey the business as I shall find means and acquaint you with all. These late eclipses in the sun and the moon portend no good to us. Mm. Love cools. Friendship falls off, brothers divide. In cities, mutinies, in countries, discord, in palaces, treason, and the bond cracked twixt son and father. We have seen the best of our time. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. This is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeit of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters, the sun, the moon, and the stars, as if we were villains by necessity. <laughs> Fools, by heavenly compulsion, my father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail. And my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows. I am rough and lecherous. Tut, I should have been that I am, had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. <laughs> Edgar, oh, when saw you my father last? Why, the night gone by. Spake you with him? I. Uh, two hours ago. Parted you in good terms? Found you no displeasure in him by word or countenance? <laughs> None at all. Bethink yourself wherein you may have offended him, and at my entreaty forbear his presence till some little time hath qualified the heat of his displeasure. <laughs> some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you, have a continent forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower. And as I say, retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my lord speak. Uh, pray you go. Here, it's my key. Uh, shall I hear from you anon? I do serve you in this business. A credulous father and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none on whose foolish honesty my practice easy rides. <laughs> I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit. 
all with me's meat that I can fashion fit. Scene three, the Duke of Albany's palace. Enter Goneril and Oswald, her steward. Did my father strike my gentleman for chiding of his fool? Yes, madam. By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other. That sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. His nights grow riotous, and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak to him. Uh, say I am sick. <laughs> He's coming, madam. I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'll have it come to question if he dislikes it. Let him do our sister whose mind and mine I know in that are one. Remember what I tell you. Well, madam. And let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it no matter. Advise your fellows so. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my very course. Prepare for dinner. Scene four. A hall in the same. Enter Kent, disguised. Hmm. If but as well I other accents borrow that can my speech diffuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which I raised my likeness. Now banished Kent, if thou canst serve, where thou dost stand condemned, so may it come, thy master, whom thou lovest, shall find thee full of labors. Come now, what art thou? Um, a man, sir. What dost thou profess? What dost thou with us? I, I do profess to be no less than I seem, to serve him truly that will put me in trust, to, to love him that is honest, to, to converse with him that is wise and says little, to fear judgment, to fight when I cannot choose, and to eat no fish. What art thou? A very honest-hearted fellow, and as poor as the king. If thou be as poor for a subject as he is for a king, thou art poor enough. What wouldst thou? Service. What wouldst thou service? You. Dost you know me, fellow? Oh, no, no, sir, no, sir. But, but you have that in your countenance, which I would fain call master. What's that? Authority. Follow me, thou shalt serve me. If mm -hmm. I like thee no worse after dinner, I will not part from thee yet. Dinner, ho, dinner. You, you, Sarah, where's my daughter? So please you. Hmm. What says the fellow there? The, call the clock pole back. Where's my fool? Ho! Who? How now? Where's that mongrel? He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. Why came not the man back to me when I called him? Sir, he answered me in the roundest manner. He would not. He would not? My lord, I know not what the matter is, but to my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There's a great abatement of kindness appears as well in the general dependence, as in the duke himself also, and your daughter. Ah. Say it, say it. Sayest thou so? I beseech you, pardon me, my lord, if I be mistaken. For my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wronged. I have perceived a most faint neglect of late. I will look further into it. But where's my fool? I've not seen him for two days. 
Since my young lady is going to France, sir, the fool hath much pined away. No more of that. I have noted it well. Go you and tell my daughter I would speak with her. Go you. Call hither my fool. Oh, you, sir, you come, you hither. So who am I, sir? Hmm. My lady's yeah. father. No, my, my lady's father, my lord's name, your horse and dog, your cur. I am none of these, my lord, I beseech your pardon. <sighs> Do you bandy looks with me, you rascal? Striking him. I'll not be struck, my lord. Nor tripped neither, you base football player. <laughs> Tripping up his heels. <laughs> uh, uh, thank thee, fellow, thou servest me, and I love thee. Come, sir, arise away. I'll, I'll teach you the differences. Away, away. <laughs> Pushes Oswald out. Now, my friendly neighbor, thank thee. There's an earnest of thy service. Let me hire him too. Here's my coxcomb. How oh, now, my pretty knave, how dost thou? Sirrah, you were best take my coxcomb. Why? Why fool? Why, for taking one's part that's out of favor. There, take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow has banished two of his daughters and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. How now, Nuncle? Would I had two coxcombs and two daughters? Why, my boy? If I gave them all my living, I'd keep my coxcombs myself. There's mine. Beg another of thy daughters. Ah, uh, uh, pestilence to call me. Sirrah, I'll teach thee a speech. Do. Mark it, Nuncle. Mm. Have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest. Lend less than thou owest, ride more than thou goest, learn more than thou trowest, set less than thou throwest. Leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door, and thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. This is nothing, fool. Then, tis like the breath of an unfeed lawyer. You gave me nothing for it. Can you make no use of nothing, uncle? Why, no, boy. Nothing can be made of nothing. Prithee, tell him. So much the rent of his land comes to. He will not believe a fool. A bitter fool. Dost thou know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet fool? No, lad, teach me. That lord that counseled thee to give away thy land, come place him here by me. Mm -hmm. Do thou for him stand. The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear. The one in motley here, the other found out there. Dost thou call me fool, boy? All thy other titles thou hast given away. That thou wast born with. Give me an egg, Nuncle, and I'll give thee two crowns. What, what two crowns shall they be? Why, after I have cut the egg in the middle, and eat up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. Mm. Thou hadst little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest thy golden one away. <laughs> if I speak like myself in this, let him be whipped that first finds it so. And your lies, sir, will have you whipped. I marvel what kin thou and thy daughters are. They'll have me whipped for speaking true, they'll have me whipped for lying, and sometimes I am whipped for holding my peace. I had rather be any kind of thing than a fool, and yet I would not be thee, uncle. Thou hast paired thy wit on both sides and left nothing in the middle. Here comes one of the pairings. Ooh. How now, daughter? What makes that frontlet on? Methinks thou art too much late in the frown. Not only, sir, this, your all-licensed fool, but other of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured riots. Sir, I had thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe redress, uh, but now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoke and done that you protect this course and, and put it on by your allowance. 
Are you our daughter? Uh, come, sir. I would you make use of that good wisdom whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions that are of late transform you from what you rightly are. May not an ass know when the cart draws the horse? Doth any here know me? This is not Leah. Doth they walk thus, speak thus? Where are his eyes? Who is it can tell me who I am? Lear's shadow. I would learn that, for by the marks of sovereignty, knowledge, and reason, I should be false persuaded I had daughters. Which they will make an obedient father. Your name, fair, gentle woman? This admiration, sir, is much on the safer of other your new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes aright. As you are old and reverend, you should be wise. Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and, and bold that this our court infected with their manners shows like a riotous inn. Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs a little to this quantity or train and the remainder that shall still depend to be such men as may besort your age and know themselves and you. Darkness and devils. Saddle my horses, call my train to get the degenerate bastard on that trouble with you have. Yet I, I have left a daughter. You strike my people, and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters. Well, the Tule repents. Oh, sir, are you come? Is it your will? Speak, sir. Prepare my horses in gratitude, thou marble-hearted fiend, more hideous when thou showest thee in a child than the sea monster. Pray, sir, be patient. Detested kite, and liest. I train our men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know and in the most exact regard support the worships of their name. O oh, most small fault, how ugly didst thou in Cordini show. Uh, yeah, Leah, Leah, beat at this gate. Let, let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. Go, go, my people. My lord, I am guiltless as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord, here, nature, here, dear goddess, here. Suspend thy purpose, if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her organs of increase, and, and from her derogate body never spring a babe to honor her. If she must teem, create her child of spleen, that it may live, and be a thwart disnatured torment to her. How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Ah, away, away. Now, gods that we adore, whereof comes this? Never afflict yourself to know the cause, but let his disposition have that scope that dotage gives it. What's the matter, sir? What? Fifty of my followers at a clap within a fortnight. What's the matter? I'll sir? tell thee, I'll tell thee, life and death. I am ashamed that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus. That these hot tears which break from me before should make thee worth them. Oh, God, I weep the scores again, I'll pluck ye out and cast you. But the waters that you lose to temper clay, yet have I left a daughter? 
who I'm sure is kind and comfortable. When she shall hear this of thee with her nails, she'll fly thy wolfish visage. You mark that, my lord. This man hath had good counsel. A hundred knights. Tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred knights. Yes, that on every dream, each buzz, each fancy, each complaint, dislike, he may engard his dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy. Oswald, I say. Well, you may fear too far. Safer than trust too far. Let me still take away the harms I fear, not fear still be to taken. I know his heart, what he hath uttered, I have rid my sister, if she sustain him, an hundred nights, when I have showed the unfitness of everything. That How now, Oswald? Oh, what have you writ that letter to my sister? Yes, madam. Uh, take you some company, and away to your horse. Inform her of my particular fear. And get you gone, and hasten your return. Uh, no, uh, no, my lord. This milky gentleness and coarse of yours, uh, though I condemn not, yet under pardon, you are much more a task for want of wisdom than a praise for harmful mildness. How far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. Striving to better, oft we mar what's well. Scene 5. Court before the same. Enter King Lear, Kent, and Fool. Go you before Gloucester with these letters. Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know than comes from her demand out of the letter. If your diligence be not speedy, I shall be there afore you. I will not sleep, my lord, till I have delivered your letter. Shalt see thy other daughter will use thee kindly. For though she's as like this as a crab's like an apple, yet I can tell what I can tell. What canst thou tell, my boy? She will taste as like this as a crab does to a crab. Thou canst tell why one's nose stands in the middle of his face? No. Why? To keep one's eyes on either side of his nose, that what a man cannot smell out, he may spy into. I did her wrong. Can't tell how an oyster makes his shell. No. Nor I neither. But I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why to put his head in, not to give it away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case. I will, I will forget my nature. So kind of father. The reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. Because they are not eight. Yes, indeed! Thou wouldst make a good fool. Monster ingratitude. If thou wert my fool, uncle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. How's that? Thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Oh, let me be not mad, not mad, sweet heaven. Keep me in temper. I would not be mad. And now, are the horses ready? Ready, my lord. Come, boy. She that's a maid now and laughs at my departure shall not be a maid long unless things be cut shorter. Act two, scene one, Gloucester's castle. Enter Edmund and Curran meets him. Save, Save thee, Curran. And you, sir. I've been with your father and given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Regan, his duchess, will be here with him this night. Well, how comes that? Nay, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad. I mean, the whispered ones, for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments. Not, I pray you. What are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward, twixt the Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? N not a word. You may do, then. In time. Fare you well, sir. 
Duke be here tonight? The better. Best. This weaves itself perforce into my business. My father hath set a guard to take my brother. And I have one thing, one of a queasy question, which I must act. Oh, briefness and fortune work. Brother, a word. Descend. Brother, I say. My father watches. Oh, sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? I'm sure, aunt, not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw. Seem to defend yourself. Now, quit you well. Yield before my father. Ah. Light, oh, here, fly. Brother, torches. <laughs> torches, so farewell. Some blood drawn on me would beget opinion. Wounds his arm. <laughs> of my more fierce endeavor, I am seen drunkards do more than this sport. Father! Father, stop! Stop! No help! Now, Edmund, where's the villain? Here he stood in the dark, his sharp sword out. But where is he? Look, sir, I bleed. Where is the villain, Edmund? Fled this way, sir. When by no means he could... By no means what? Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. But that I told him the revenging gods against parasites did all their thunders bend, seeing how loathly opposite I stood to his unnatural purpose in fell motion with his prepared sword, he charges home my unprovided body, lanced mine arm, but when he saw my best alarmed spirits, oh, suddenly he fled. Let him fly far. Not in this land shall he remain uncaught and found dispatch. The noble duke, my master, my worthy arch and patron comes tonight. By his authority, I will proclaim it, that he which finds him shall deserve our thanks, bringing the murderous coward to the stake. But he that conceals him, death. Tuck it within. Hark, the Duke's trumpets. I know not why he comes. All ports I'll bar, the villain shall not scape. Loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. How now, my noble friend? Since I came hither, which I can call but now, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short, which can pursue the offender. How dost, my lord? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracking. Crack it. What, did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named, your Edgar? Oh, lady, lady, shame would have it hid. Was he not companion with the riotous knights that tend upon my father? Yes, madam, he was of that consort. No marvel then, though he were ill afflicted. I have this present evening from my sister been well informed of them, and with such cautions that if they come to sojourn at my house, I'll not be there. Nor I assure thee, Regan. Edmund, I hear that you have shown your father a childlike office. Twas my duty, sir. He did bewray his practice and receive this hurt you see, striving to apprehend him. If he be taken, he shall never more be feared of doing harm. 
make your own purpose how in my strength you please. For you, Edmund, whose virtue and obedience doth this instant so much commend itself, you shall be ours. Natures of such deep trust we shall much need. You we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir. Truly, however else. For him, I thank your grace. You know not why we came to visit you. Thus out of season, threading dark-eyed night, occasions noble Gloucester of some poise, wherein we must have use of your advice. Our father, he hath writ, so has our sister of differences, which I least thought fit to answer from our home, the several messengers from hence attend dispatch. Our good old friend, lay comforts to your bosom and bestow your needful counsel to our business. Your graces are right welcome. Scene two, before Gloucester's castle. Enter Kent and Oswald, severally. Good dawning to thee, friend, art of this house. Aye. Where may we, meet? Where may we set our horses? <laughs> In the mire. For thee, if thou lust me, tell me. I love thee not. Why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know of me? A knave, a rascal. An eater of broken meats, base, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy, worse stocking knave, a lily-livered, action-taking knave, a whoreson, one that wouldst be aboard, in way of good service, and art nothing but the composition of a knave, beggar, coward, pander, one whom I will beat into clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. Why, what a monstrous fellow art thou, thus to rail on one that is neither known of thee nor knows thee. What a brazen-faced varlet art thou, to deny thou knowest me. Is it two days ago since I tripped up thy heels and beat thee before the king? Draw, you rogue. Draw, you horse and cullenly barber monger, draw! Drawing his sword. Away! I have nothing to do with thee. Draw, you rascal. You come with letters against the king. Draw, you rogue, or I'll so carbonode your shanks. Help! Oh, murder! Murder! How now? What's the matter? With you, goodman boy, and you please come, I'll flesh ye. Come on, young master. Weapons? Arms? What's the matter here? Keep peace. Upon your lives he dies that strikes again. What is the matter? Messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak. I'm scarce in breath, my lord. No, Marvel. You have so bestirred your valor. Speak yet, how grew your quarrel? This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I have spared at suit of his gray beard. Thou horse and zed, thou unnecessary letter, my lord. If you will give me leave, I will tread this unbolted villain into mortar and dog the walls of Jake's with him. Spare my gray beard, you wagtail. Peace, sirrah, you beastly knave. Know you no reverence? Yes, sir, but anger hath a privilege. Why art thou angry? That such a knave as this should wear a sword who wears no honesty. Smile you my speeches as I were a fool. Goose, if I had you upon Sarum Plain, I will drive you Crack-cackling home to Camelot. Why dost thou call him a knave? What's his offense? His countenance likes me not. No more perchance does mine, nor his, nor hers. Sir, tis my occupation to be plain. 
I have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder that I see before me at this instant. This is some fellow who, having been praised for bluntness, doth affect a saucy roughness and constrains the god quite from his nature. He cannot flatter. He, an honest mind and plain, must speak truth. I know, sir. I am no flatterer. What was the offense you gave him? I never gave him any. It pleased the king, his master, very late to strike at me upon his misconstruction, when he, conjunct and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and put upon him such a deal of men that worthied him, that praises of the king, and in the fleshment of this dread exploit, drew on me here again. Fetch forth the stocks. Hmm. You stubborn ancient knave, you reverend braggart, we'll teach you. Sir, I am too old to learn. Call not your stocks for me, I serve the king, on whose employment I was sent to you. Fetch forth the stocks. As I have life and honor, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon? Till night, my lord, and all night too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the selfsame color our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. Stocks brought out. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. His fault is much, and the good king, his master, will check him for it. The king must take it ill that he so slightly valued in his messenger should have him thus restrained. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse to have her gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs. Put in his legs. Kent is put in the stocks. Come, my good lord, away. I am sorry for thee, friend. Tis the Duke's pleasure, whose disposition all the world well knows, will not be rubbed or stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Hey, do not, sir. Uh, I have watched and traveled hard. Some time I shall sleep out. <laughs> the rest I'll whistle. A good man's fortune may grow out of grow out hills. Give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame in this. It will be ill taken. Scene three, a wood. Enter Edgar. I heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree escape head the hunt. Whilst I may escape, I will preserve myself, and then be thought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury and contempt of man brought near to beast. My face, I'll grime with filth. <laughs> Blanket my loins, elf, haul my hair in knots, and with presented nakedness, I'll face the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars who, with roaring voices, sometime with lunatic bands, Sometime with prayers, enforce their charity. Poor holy God. Poor Tom. That's something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. Scene four. Before Gloucester's castle, Kent is in the stocks. Enter King Lear, fool, and gentleman. Tis strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. As I learned the night before, there was no purpose in them of this remove. Hail to thee, noble master. Ah, makest thou this shame thy pastime? Oh no, my lord. <laughs> he wears cruel garters. What's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? 
It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say yay. By Jupiter, I swear no. By Juno, I swear I. No, just not do it. They could not, would not do it. It is worse than murder. Resolve me with all modest haste. Which way thou mightst deserve, or they impose this usage coming from us? My lord, when at their home I did commend your highness's letters to them, ere I was risen from the place that showed my duty kneeling, came there a reeking post, stewed in his haste, half breathless, panting forth from Goneril his mistress salutations. Being the very fellow that of late displayed so saucily against your highness, having more man than wit about me, drew. He raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Where is this daughter? With the earl, sir, here within. Follow me not. Stay here. Made you no more offence but what you speak of? None. How chance the king comes with so small a train? And now it's been set in the stocks for that question, you had well deserved it. Why, fool? We'll set thee to school to an ant, to teach thee there's no laboring in the winter. All that follow their noses are led by their eyes but blind men, and there's not a nose among twenty but can smell him that's stinking. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again. I would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. That sir which seeks and serves for gain and follows but for form will pack when it begins to rain and leave thee in the storm. But I will tarry, the fool will stay and let the wise man fly. The knave turns fool that runs away, the fool no knave per die. Where learned you this, fool? Not in the stocks, fool. Deny to speak with me? The sick? They're weary? Travel all night? Yeah, fetch is fetch me a better answer. My dear lord, you know the fiery quality of the duke. How unremovable and fixed he is in his own course. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion. Fiery what? Quality, why Gloucester, Gloucester? I'd speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed them so. Informed them? Dost thou understand me, man? Aye, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak. Commands her service. Are they informed of this? My breath and blood, fiery, fiery duke. Uh, tell the heart duke that no, not yet. Maybe he is not well. Infirmity doth still neglect all office. Whereto our health is bound, we are not ourselves. When nature, being oppressed, commands the mind to suffer with the body. I'll forbear. Go tell the duke and the wife. I'll speak with them now, presently. Bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cry sleep to death. I would have all well betwixt you. Oh, me, my heart, my rising heart. Down. <laughs> Good morrow to you both. Hail to your grace. Kent is set at liberty. I am glad to see your highness. Weak, and I think you are. I know what reason I have to think so. If thou shouldst not be glad, I would divorce me from thy mother's tomb, sepulchring an adulteress. Beloved Regan, thy sister's not a Regan. She hath tied sharp-toothed unkindness like a vulture. Yeah. 
I pray you, sir, take patience. I have hope you less know how to value her deserts than she does scant her duty. Say, so how, how, how is that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. If, sir, perchance she have restrained the riots of your followers, tis on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. My curse is on her. Oh, sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, I pray you that to our sister you do make return, say you have wronged her, sir. I ask her forgiveness. Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. <laughs> Age is unnecessary. On my knees, I beg that you'll vouchsafe me a raiment, bed, and food. Good sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of half my train, looked down upon me, struck me with her tongue. All the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her ungrateful top. Ah, the blessed God, so will you wish on me when the rash mood is on. Now, no, Regan, thou, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender hefted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. Her eyes are fierce, but thine do comfort and not burn. Thou better knowest the offices of nature, bond of childhood. Thy half of the kingdom hast thou not forgot wherein I thee endowed. Good sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? Tuck it within. Is your lady come? This is a knave whose easy-borrowed pride dwells in the flick, fickle grace of her. He follows our varlet from my sight out. What means your grace? Who shot my servant? Bring it. A good hope thou didst not know. Who comes here? Heavens. Uh, if you do love old men, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if yourselves are old, make it cause, send down and take my part. Are not ashamed to look upon this beard. Oh, Regan, wilt thou take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offense that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so. Oh, sides, you are too rough. Will you hold yet? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there. Sir, but his own disorders deserved much less advancement. You. <laughs> you. I pray you, Father, being weak, seem so. If till the expiration of your month you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. Return to her and fifty men dismissed. No. Rather, I abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air. To be a comrade with the wolf and owl, necessity's sharp pinch. Return with her? At your choice, sir. Pretty daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. Will no more meet, no more see one another. But yet, I want my flesh, my blood, uh, my daughter, or rather a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine, 
but I'll not chide thee. Men when thou canst be better at thy leisure. I can be patient, I can stay with reason. I am a hundred knights. <laughs> not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister, for those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old. And so, but she knows what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir. What, 50 followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants or, or from mine? Why not, my lord? And if then they chance to slack you, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositaries. We kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What must, must I come to you with five and twenty, Regan said you so? And speak again, my lord, no more with me. <laughs> Those wicked creatures, yet do you look well favoured? When others are more wicked, not being the worst, stands in some rank of praise. I'll go with thee. By fifty, yet doth double five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty, ten or five, uh, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend to you? What need one? O oh, reason, not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Well, not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts, but for true need. You, heavens, give me patience, patience, I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man. Is full of grief, as age, wretched and bold. If it be you that stir these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. No, you are natural hags. I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall. I will. I will do such things. But they are yet, I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws. Shall break it. Oh, where are we? Oh, fool. I shall go mad. Storm and Tempest. Let us withdraw. Twill be a storm. This house is little. The old man and his people cannot be well bestowed. It is his own blame. Hath put himself from rest and, and must needs taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. So am I purposed. Where is my lord of Gloucester? Follow the old man forth. He is returned. King is in high rage. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? He calls to horse. Whither is he going? He calls to horse. But will I not know not whither? Tis best to give him way, he leads himself. My lord, entreat him by no means to stay. Alack, the night comes on, and the bleak winds do surely ruffle for many miles about their scarce bush. 
Oh, sir, to willful men, the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors. He is attended with a desperate train, and what they may incense him to, being apt to have his ear abused, wisdom bids fear. Shut up your doors, my lord. Tis a wild night. My Regan counsels well. Come, out of the storm. Intermission. Five minute break. We will return at 8.59.
All right, Jared, please read us back on in. Act three, scene one. The heath, storm still, enter King Lear and fool. We are ready to begin act two. Xander, are you ready? All right, Jared, read us in one more time, please. Act three, scene one, the heath, storm still. Enter King Lear and fool. Blow winds and crack your cheeks, rage, blow you cataracts and hurricane spout, till you have drenched us deep and drowned the cocks, you sulfurous and thought executing fires, vaunt couriers to oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head and thou all shaking thunder, Smite flat the thick rotundity of the world, crack nature's molds, and Germans spill at once that make ungrateful man. Uncle Hol Court Holy Water in a dry house is better than this rainwater out of door. Good uncle, in and ask thy daughter's blessing. Here's a night pities neither wise man nor fool. Rumble thy belly full, spit, fire, spout. Rain, nor rain, wind, thunder, fire on my daughters. Attacks not you, you elements, you unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me no subscription. And that for your horrible pleasure, here I stand. <laughs> A poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. But yet I, I call you servile ministers to have that have with two pernicious daughters joined your high intended battles against her head so old and white is this. Oh, oh, tis thou all. He that has a house to put its head in has a good headpiece. No, I will be the pattern of all patience, I will see. Who's there? Mary, here's Grace and a codpiece. That's a wise man and a fool. Alas, sir, are you here? Things that love night love not such nights as these. Let the great gods that keep this dreadful pother all our heads find out their enemies now. Tremble, you wretch, you wretch that has within thee none divulged crimes. Rive your concealing continents and cry these dreadful summoners, Grace, I am a man. More sinned against than sinning. Gracious, my lord. Hard by here is a hovel. Some friendship will it lend you against the tempest. My wits begin to turn. Come on, my boy. How dost, my boy? Hot cold. I'm cold myself. Where is this straw, my fellow? The art of our necessity strains it can make vile things precious. He that has and a little tiny wit with a hey ho with a wind and the rain must make content with his fortunes fit for the rain. It raineth every day. True, my good boy. Come, bring us to this hovel. This is a brave night to cool a courtesan. I'll speak a prophecy ere I go. When priests are more in wood than matter, when brewers mar their malt with water, when nobles are their tailors' tutors, no heretics burned but wenches' suitors, then shall the realm of Albion, 
come to great confusion. This prophecy Merlin shall make, for I live before his time. Scene 2. Gloucester's Castle. Enter Gloucester and Edmund. Alack, alack, Edmund, I like not this unnatural dealing. When I desire their leave that I might pity him, they took me from me the use of my own house, charged me on pain of their perpetual displeasure, neither to speak of him, entreat for him, nor any way to sustain him. Most savage and unnatural. Go to, say you nothing. There's a division betwixt the dukes and a worse matter than that. I have received a letter this night. These injuries the king now bears will be revenged home. There's a power already footed. We must incline to the king. I will seek him and privily relieve him. Go you and maintain talk with the duke that my charity be not of him perceived. There is some strange thing toward Edmund. Pray you, pray you be careful. This courtesy forbid thee shall the Duke instantly know, and of that letter too. This seems a fair deserving and must Draw me that which my father loses, no less than all. The younger rises when the old doth fall. Scene three, the heath, before a hovel. Enter King Lear, Kent, and Fool. Good my lord, enter here. Nothing is too much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin. So tis to thee, but where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce felt. When the mind's free, the body's delicate. The tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling else, save what beats there. Filial ingratitude, no, we, no more. In such a night, shut me out. Pour on, I will endure. In such a night as this, O oh, Regan, Goneril, your old kind father, whose frank heart gave all. No, that way madness lies. Let me shun that. No more on that. Good, my lord, enter here. Prithee go thyself, seek thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more. Go, oh, oh, go, I'll, I'll, I'll go in. In boy, go first, your houseless poverty. Poor naked wretches, that's where you are, by the pelting of this pitiless storm. <clears throat> How shall your houseless heads defend you from seasons such as these? I've taken too little care of this. Fathom and a half! <laughs> Poor Tom! I'm not in here, Uncle. There's a spirit! Help me! Help me! Give me thy hand. Who's there? <laughs> a spirit! A spirit! He says his name's Poor Tom! What art thou that dost grumble there in the straw? Come forth. Way, foul fiend follows me. Through the sharp hawthorn blows the cold wind. Hum. Go to thy cold bed and warm thee. Hast thou given all to thy two daughters? And art thou come to this? Who gives anything to poor Tom? 
whom the foul fiend hath led through the fire and through flame, and through ford and whirlypool, ere bog and quagmire, that hath laid knives under his pillow, set rats bane by his porridge. Bless thy five wits, Tom Zuko. <laughs> what have his daughters brought him to this pass? Could thou say nothing? Did thou give him all? Nay, he reserved a blanket. Else we had all been shamed. He hath no daughter, sir. Death, traitor. Nothing could have subdued nature to such a lowness of his unkind daughters. Pillicock sat on Pillicock Hill. Halloo, halloo, loo, loo. Cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen. Take heed, O oh, the foul fiend. Obey thy parents, keep thy word justly, swear not. Commit not with man's sworn spouse. Tom's a cold. What hast thou been? A serving man, proud in heart and mind, that served the lust of my mistress's heart, and did the act of darkness with her. Swore as many oaths as I spake words, and broke them in the sweet face of heaven. Wine. Love thy deeply, dice dearly, false of heart, light of ear, bloody of hand, hog and sloth, fox and stealth, wolf and greediness, dog and madness, lion and prey. Keep my foot out of brothels and defy the foul fiend. Oh, why? Thou wert better in thy grave than to answer with this. Uncovered body, this extremity of the skies, is no man no more than this. Consider him well, thou owest the worm, no silk, the beast, no hide, the sheep, no wool, no art, the thing itself. Unaccommodated man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Off, off your lendings, come. Unbutton the earth. Prithee, they know you tinted. Tis a naughty night to swim in. Look, here comes a walking fire. <gasps> this is the foul fiend, Fliberty Gibbet. He begins at curfew and walks till the first cock. Arroint thee, witch, arroint thee. Who's there? What is it you seek? What are you there? Your names? Poor Tom, that eats the swimming frog, the toad, the tadpole, the wall newt, and the water, that in the fury of his heart, when the foul fiend rages, eats cow dung for salads. Beware, my follower, peace, smoke in peace, thou fiend. What, hath your grace no better company? The prince of darkness is a gentleman. Modo, he's called, and Mars. A flesh and blood is grown so vile, my lord, that it doth hate what gets it. Poor Tom's a cold. Go in with me. My duty cannot suffer to obey in all your daughter's hard commands. Though their injunction be to bar my doors, and let this tyrannous night take hold upon you, yet I have ventured to come seek you out and bring you where both fire and food is ready. First, let me talk with this philosopher. What is the cause of this thunder? Good, my lord, take his offer, go into the house. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a word with this same learned Theban. What is your study? To kill vermin. Let me ask you one, one word in private. Importune him once more to go, my lord. His wits begin to unsettle. Canst thou blame him? His daughters seek his death. Ah, oh, that good Kent, he said it would be thus, poor banished man. Thou sayest the king grows mad? I'll tell thee, friend, I am almost mad myself. I had a son. Now outlawed from my blood, he sought my life. But lately, very late, I loved him, friend. No father, his son dearer, truth to tell thee. The grief hath crazed my wits. What a night this! I do beseech your grace. Cry your mercy, sir. 
of the philosophy of company. Arms are cold. In, fellow there, into the hovel, keep thee warm! Come, let's in all. This way, my lord. With him, uh, I, I will keep still with my philosopher. Good, my lord, soothe him. Let him take the fellow. Take him you on. Come, good Athenian. Guiled Rowland to the dark tower came. His word was still. Fire, foe, and fum. I smell the blood of a British mum. Scene four, Gloucester's castle. Enter Cornwall and Edmund. I will have my revenge ere I depart this house. How, oh, my lord, I may be censured that nature thus gives way to loyalty. Something fears me to think of. I now perceive it was not altogether your brother's evil disposition made him seek his death. How malicious is my fortune that I must repent to be just. <clears throat> this is the letter he spoke of, which approves him an intelligent party to the advantages of France. <sighs> Heavens, that this treason were not, were not I the detector. If the matter of this paper be certain, you have mighty business in hand. True or false, it hath made thee Earl of Gloucester. Seek out where thy father is, that he may be ready for our apprehension. If I find him comforting the king, it will be stuff his suspicion more fully. I will persevere in my course of loyalty, though the conflict be sore between that and my blood. I will lay trust upon thee, and thou shalt find a dearer father in my love. Scene 5. A chamber in a fa farmhouse adjoining the castle. Enter Gloucester, King Lear, Kent, Fool, and Edgar. Here is better than the open air. Take it thankfully, and I will piece out the comfort with what addition I can. The guards reward your kindness. Pray, innocent, and beware the foul fiend. Prithee, Nuncle, tell me whether a madman be a gentleman or a yeoman. A king, a king. No, he's a yeoman that has a gentleman to his son, for he's a mad yeoman that sees his son a gentleman before him. Foul fiend bites my back. He's mad that trusts in the tameness of a wolf, a horse's health, a boy's love, or a whore's oath. It shall be done. I will arraign them straight. Come, sit thou here, most learned justice, sir. Thou, <clears throat> sapient sir, sit here. Now, she foxes. Look, where he stands and glares. Wantest thou eyes at trial, madam? How do you, sir? Stand you not so amazed? Or will you lie down and rest upon the cushions? I'll see the trial first, bring in the evidence. Thou, robed man of justice, take thy place, and thou, his yoke fellow of equity, bench by his side. You are of the commission, sit you too. Let us deal justly. Arraign her first, tis Goneril. I here take my oath before this honorable assembly. She kicked the poor king, her father. Come hither, mistress. Is your name Goneril? She cannot deny it. Call you mercy. I took you for a joint stool. And here's another whose warped looks proclaim what store her heart is made on. Stop her there. Arms, arms, sword, fire. Corruption in the place. All justice, sir. Why thou, why hast thou let her escape? Bless thy five wits. Oh, pity. Sir, where is your patience now that thou so oft have boasted to retain? 
My tears begin to take his part so much, they'll mar my counterfeiting. The dogs and all tray blanche and sweetheart see, they bark at me. Tom will throw his head at them. Avant you curs! And let them atomize Regan, see what breeds about her heart. Is there any cause in nature that makes these hard hearts? Uh, you, sir, I entertain one of my hundred, only I do not like the fashion of your garments. Let them be changed. Now, good my lord, lie here and rest a while. Make no noise, make no noise. Draw the curtain, so, so, so. We'll go to supper in the morning. So, so, so. And I'll go to bed at noon. Come hither, friend. Where is the king, my master? Here, sir. But trouble him not, his wits are gone. Good friend, I prithee, take him in thy arms. I have o'erheard a plot of death upon him. There is a litter ready, lay him in't, and drive towards Dover. My friend, where thou shalt meet both welcome and protection. Oppressed nature sleeps. This rest might yet have balm thy broken senses, which, if convenience will not allow, stand in hard cure. How light and portable my pain seems now, when that which makes me bend makes the king bow. In childhood as I fathered Tom, away. Mark the high noises and thyself be ray. When false opinion whose wrong thought defiles thee in thy just proof repeals and reconciles thee. What will hap more tonight? Safe escape the king. Lark, lark. Scene six, Gloucester's castle. Enter Cornwall, Regan, Goneril and Edmund. Ho, ho, speedily to my lord, your husband, to show him this letter. The army of France is landed. Seek out the villain Gloucester. Hang him instantly. Pluck out his eyes. Leave him to my displeasure. Edmund, keep you our sister company. The revenges we are bound to take upon your traitorous father do not fit for your beholding. Farewell, dear sister. Farewell, my lord of Gloucester. How now, where is the king? My lord of Gloucester hath conveyed him hence. Some five or six and thirty of his knights are gone with him towards Dover, where they boast to have well-armed friends. Get horses for your mistress. Farewell, sweet lord and sister. Edmund. Farewell. Who's there? The traitor! Ingrateful fox, tis he! Bind fast his corky arms. What means your graces? Good my friends, consider you are my guests. Do me, do me no foul play, friends. Bind him, I say. <sighs> Hard, hard, <clears throat> filthy traitor. Come, sir, what letters had you late from France? Be simple, answerer, for we know the truth. And what confederacy have you with the traitors late footed in the kingdom? To whose hands have you sent the lunatic king? Speak. I, I have a letter guessingly set down, which came from one that's of a neutral heart, and not from one opposed. Cunning. And false. Mm -hmm. Where hast thou sent the king? Dover. Wherefore to Dover? Was thou not charged at peril? Wherefore to Dover? Let him first answer that. I'm tied to the stake and I must stand the course. Wherefore to Dover? Because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes. 
<laughs> See it, shalt thou never, fellows hold the chair, upon these eyes of thine I'll set my foot. He that will think to live till he be old, give me some help! Oh, cruel! Oh, oh, you god! Cornwall plucks out one of Gloucester's <laughs> eyes and stabs on it. <laughs> One side will mock another, the other too. If you see vengeance. Hold your hand, my lord. I have served you ever since I was a child, but better service have I never done you than now to bid you hold. How now, you dog? If you did wear a beard upon your chin, I'd shake it on this quarrel. What do you mean? My villain. They draw and fight. Nay, come on then, take the chance of anger! Give me thy sword, a peasant stand up thus! Takes a sword and runs at him behind. <gasps> Slain! My lord, you have what I left to see some mischief on him. Oh. Dies. Less it is more. Pre out. By Jill. Plucks out Gloucester's <laughs> other eye. Where is thy luster now? <laughs> Comfortless. Where's my son Edmund? Edmund and kindle all the sparks of nature to quit this horrid act. Out, treacherous villain! Thou cost on him that hates thee. It was he that made the overture of thy treasons to us, who is too good to pity thee. Oh, my follies! Then Edgar was abused, kind gods. Forgive me that and prosper him. Go thrust him out at gates and let him smell his way to Dover. How is my lord? How look you? I received a hurt. Follow me, lady. Turn out that eyeless villain. Throw this slave upon the dunghill. Regan, I bleed apace. Ultimately, come, untimely comes this hurt. Give me your arm. Act four, scene one, the heath. Enter Edgar. Yet better thus. And known to be contemned, and still contemned and flattered. Welcome then, thou unsubstantial air that I embrace. A wretch that thou hast blown unto the worst, owes nothing to thy blasts. But who comes here? My father. Poorly led. World. World. Oh, world! Oh, good, my, my, my good lord! I have been your tenant and your father's tenant these fourscore years! Away, get thee away! Good friend, be gone! Thy comforts can do me no good at all. Thee they may hurt. Oh, alack, sir, uh, you cannot see your way. I have no way and therefore want no eyes. I stumbled when I saw. Dear son of Edgar, the food of thy abused father's wrath. Might I but live to see thee in my touch, I, I'd say I had eyes again. How now? Who's there? Say I am at the worst. I am worse than e'er I ever was. Tis poor man, Tom. Fellow, where ghost? Is it a beggar man? Madman, and beggar too. He has some reason else he could not beg. The last night's storm I, I such a fellow saw, which made me think a man, a worm, my son, came then into my mind, and yet my mind was then scarce friends with him. I, I have heard more since. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. They kill us for their sport. How should this be? 
That is the trade that must play fool to sorrow, angering itself and others. Bless thee, master. Is that the naked fellow? Aye, my lord. Then prithee get thee gone. If for my sake thou wilt o'ertake us, hence a mile or twain, in the way toward Dover, do it for ancient love, and bring some covering for this naked soul, who I'll entreat to lead me. Alack, sir, he's mad. Tis the time's play when madmen lead the blind. Do as I bid thee. Or rather do thy pleasure above the rest. Be gone! I, I, I'll bring him the best peril that I have. Come on, to what will? Sira? Naked fellow? Poor Tom's a cold. Bless thy sweet eyes, they bleed. Knowst thou the way to Dover? Both style and gait, horseway and footpath. Poor Tom hath been scared out of his good wits. Bless thee, goodman's son. When the foul fiend, five fiends have been in poor Tom at once, so bless thee, master. Here, uh, take this purse, thou who the heavens plague, have humbled to all strokes that I am wretched. It makes thee the happier. Dost thou know Dover? Aye, master. There is a cliff whose high and bending head looks fearfully in the confined deep. Bring me but to the very brim of it, and I'll repair the misery thou dost bear with something rich about me. From that place I shall no leading need. Give me thy arm, poor Tom shall lead thee. Scene two, before Albany's palace. Enter Goneril and Edmund. Welcome, my lord. I wonder, I marvel our mild husband not met us on the way. Uh, now, where's your master? Madam, within, but never man so changed. I told him of the army that was landed. He smiled at it. I told him you were coming. His answer was, the worse. <sighs> what most he should dislike seems pleasant to him. What like, offensive. It is the cowish terror of his spirit that dares not undertake. He'll not feel wrongs which tie him to an answer. Back, Edmund to my brother. Hasten his musters and conduct his powers. This trusty servant shall pass between us. Ere long you are like to hear, if you dare venture in your own behalf, a mistress's command. Wear this spare speech. Decline your head, this kiss. If it durst speak, would stretch thy spirits up into the air. Conceive, and fare thee well. Yours, in the ranks of death. <laughs> My most dear Gloucester. Oh, the difference of a man and man. To thee, a woman's services are due. My fool usurps my body. Madam, here comes my lord. I have been worth the whistle. O oh, Goneril, you are not worth the dust which the rude wind blows in your face. No more. This text is foolish. Wisdom and goodness to the vile seem vile. Filths savor but themselves. What have you done? Tigers! Not daughters, what have you performed? If that the heavens do not their visible spirits send quickly down to tame these vile offenses, it will come. Humanity must perforce prey on itself like monsters of the deep. Milk-livered man. 
There's a cheek for blows, a head for wrongs. France sped, spreads his banners in our noiseless land, whilst thou, a moral fool, sits still and criest, Alack, why does he so? Be thyself, devil. Vain fool. What news? Oh, my good lord, the Duke of Cornwall's dead, slain by his servant, going to put out the other eye of Gloucester. Gloucester's eye? A servant that he bred, thrilled with remorse, opposed against the act, bending his sword to his great master, who thereat enraged flew on him, and amongst them felled him dead, but not without the harmful stroke which since hath plucked him after. This shows you are above, you justicers, that these are nether crimes so speedily convenge. Oh, poor Gloucester. Lost he his other eye? Both. Both, my lord. This letter, madam, craves a speedy answer. Tis from your sister. One way I like this well. But being widow, and my gosh, sir, with her, may all the building in my fancy pluck upon my hateful life another way? And this news is not so tart. I'll read an answer. Where was his son when they did take his eyes? Come with my lady hither. He is not here. No, my good lord. I met him back again. Knows he the wickedness? Ay, my good lord. Twas he informed against him. Gloucester, I live to thank thee for the love thou showedst the king and to revenge thine eyes. Come hither, friend. Tell me what more thou knowst. Scene three. A tent. Enter with drum and colors Cordelia, doctor, and soldiers. Alack, tis he. Why, he was met even now as mad as the vexy, singing aloud. Search every acre in the high-grown field and bring him to our eye. What can man's wisdom in the restoring his bereaved sense? He that helps him take all my outward worth. There is means, madam. Our, our foster nurse of nature is posed the which he lacks, that to provoke in him are many simples operative, whose power will close the eye of anguish. All oh, blessed secrets, all you unpublished virtues of the earth spring with my tears. Be adiant and remediate in the good man's distress. Seek, seek for him, lest his ungoverned rage dissolve the life that wants the means to lead it. News, madam. The British powers are marching hitherward. Tis known before. Our preparation stands in expectation of them. Oh, dear father, it is thy business that I go about. No blown ambition doth our arms incite, but love, dear love, in our aged father's right. Soon may I hear and see him. Scene four. Gloucester's Castle. Enter Regan and Oswald. Are my brother's powers set forth? Aye, madam. Himself in person there. Madam, with much ado. Your sister is the better soldier. Lord Edmund spake not with your lord at home? No, madam. Faith, he is posted here on serious matter. It was great ignorance, Gloucester's eyes being out to let him live. Where he arrives, he moves all hearts against us. Edmund, I think, is gone, in pity of his misery, to dispatch his knighted life. Moreover, to describe the strength of the enemy. I must needs after him, madam, with my letter. Our troops set forth tomorrow. Stay with us. The ways are dangerous. I may not, madam. My lady has charged my duty in this business. Why should she write to Edmund? Might not you transport her purposes by word? Belike something, I know not what. 
I love thee much. Let me unseal the letter. Madam, I am not a... I know your lady does not love her husband. I am sure of that, and at her late being here, she gave strange oyads and most speaking looks to noble Edmund. I know you are of her bosom. I, madam. I speak in understanding. You are, I note. Therefore, I do advise you, take this note. My lord is dead. Edmund and I have talked, and more convenient is he for my hand than for your ladies. You may gather more. If you do find him, pray you give him this. And when your mistress hears thus much from you, I pray desire her to call her wisdom to her. If you do chance to hear of that blind traitor, preferment falls on him that cuts him off. Would I could meet him, madam. I should slow show what party I do follow. Fare thee well. Scene 5. Fields near Dover. Enter Gloucester and Edgar, dressed like a peasant. When shall we come to the top of that same hill? You climb up it now. Look how we labor. He thinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. Hark! Do you hear the sea? No, truly. Why, then your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes' anguish. So may it be indeed. Methinks thy voice is altered, and thou speaks in better phrase and manner than thou didst. You're much deceived. In nothing am I changed but my garments. And methinks you're better spoken. Come on, sir. Here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy it is to cast one's eyes so low. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle petals chafes cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more, lest my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Set me where you stand. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge, for all beneath the moon would I not leap upright. Let go my hand. Here, a friend, another purse. The fairies and gods prosper it with thee. Go thou farther off. Bid me farewell and let me hear thee going. Now fare you well, good sir. With all my heart. Trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it. Oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce, and in your sight shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills, my snuff and loathed parts of nature should burn itself out. If Edgar live, oh, bless him. Now, fellow, fare thee well. He falls forward. Gone, sir. Farewell. And yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. Had he been where he thought by this, had thought been passed, Alive or dead. All you, sir, friend, ere you, sir, speak. Us mighty pass indeed, yet he revives. What are you, sir? Away, and let me die. Hadst thou been not but gossamer, feathers, air, so many fathom down precipitating, thou didst shiver like an egg, but thou dost breathe. Ask every substance, bleeds not, speaks, art sound. Thy life's a miracle! Speak yet again! But have I fallen, or, or no? From the dread summit of this chalky barn, look up at it! The shrill gorged lark so far cannot be seen or heard, but do look up! Alack, I have no eyes. 
Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? Give me your arm. Up. So. How still. Feel you your legs. You stand. Too well. Too well. This is above all strangeness. Upon the crown of the cliff, what thing was that that parted from you? A poor, unfortunate beggar. As I stood here below, me thought his eyes were two full moons. He had a thousand noses, horns welked and waved like the enrigid sea. It was some feigned. Therefore, thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who make them honours of men's impossibilities have preserved thee. I do remember now that thing you speak of. I took it for a man. Often t'would say, the fiend, the fiend. He led me to that place. Their free and patient thoughts. But who comes here? No, they cannot touch me for coining. I am the king himself. <laughs> oh, thou sighed, piercing sight. Nature's above art in that respect. Look, look, a mouse. Peace, peace, this piece of toasted cheese will do it. Sweet marjoram. Pass. I know that voice. Ah, Goneril with a white beard. They flattered me like a dog and told me I had white hairs in my beard ere the black ones were there. They told me I was everything. This is a lie. I'm not ague proof. The trick of that voice I do well remember. Is it not the king? Yeah, he's every inch a king. When I do stare, see how the subjects quake. I pardon that man's life. What was that cause? Adultery? I shall not die, die for adultery. No, let copulation thrive. For Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughter's was forgotten between the lawful sheets. Oh, let me kiss that hand. Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. Oh, ruined piece of nature. This great world shall so wear out to naught. Dost, dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well enough. Dost thou squint at me? No. Do thy worst, blind Cupid. For not love. I read out this challenge. Mark the penning of it. For all the letters, sons, I could not see one. I would not take this from report. It is, and my heart breaks at it. Read, read, read. What, with the case of eyes? Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. Are you there with me? No eyes in your head, no, no money in your purse. Yet you see how this world goes? I see it feelingly. What, what, mad? A man may see how this world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. See how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief. Hark, in thine ear, change places, and handy dandy, which is the justice, which is the thief. I was seeing a farmer's dog bark at a beggar. Uh, aye, sir. And the creature run from the cur. There thou mightst behold the great image of authority. The dogs obeyed in office, yet the glass eyes, and like a scurvy politician, seemed to the things thou dost not. Oh, matter and impertinency mixed, reason in madness. <laughs> If thou wilt weep, my fortunes take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Thou must be patient. We came crying hither. Thou knowest first time that we smell the air. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. I'll put in proof. 
And when I have stoned upon these sons-in-laws, then kill, 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 kill. Oh, here he is. Lay hand upon him. Sir, your most dear daughter. No. Rescue? What, a prisoner? And even the natural fool of fortune, use me well. You shall have ransom. Let me have surgeons who <laughs> cut to the brains. You shall have anything. I am a king. My masters know you that. You are a royal one and we obey you. And there's life in it. Nay, if you get it, you shall get it with running. Sa, sa, sa. A sight, a sight most pitiful in the meanest wretch. Past speaking of in a king, thou hast one daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. Will you ever, gentle gods, take my breast from me? Let not my worse spirit tempt me again to die before you, please. Well, pray you, Father. Now, good sir, what are you? A most poor man, made tame to fortune's blows, who by the art of known and feeling sorrows am pregnant to good pity. Give me your hand. I'll lead you to some biding. Haughty thanks. The bounty and the venison of heaven to boot. And boot. A proclaimed prize, most happy. That eyeless head of thine was first framed flesh to raise my fortunes. Edgar imposes. Wherefore, bold peasant, darest thou support a published traitor? Hence lest that the infection of his fortune take like hold on thee. Let go his arm out, Dunghill. They fight, and Edgar <laughs> knocks him down. Nay, thou hast slain me, villain. Take my purse. If ever thou wilt thrive, bury my body, and give the letters which thou findst about me to Edmund. Earl of Gloucester, seek him out upon the British party. Oh, untimely death. Dies. I know thee well, a serviceable villain. What, is he dead? Sit you down, father. Rest you. Let's see these pockets. The letters that he speaks of may be my friends. Let our reciprocal vows be remembered. You have many opportunities to cut him off. There is nothing done if he return the conqueror. Then I am the prisoner, and his bed my jail. From the loathed warmth whereof deliver me, and supply the place for your labor. Your wife, so I would say, affectionate servant, Goneril. O oh, undistinguished space of woman's will, a plot upon her virtuous husband's life, and the exchange, my brother? The king is mad. How stiff is my vile sense that I stand up and have ingenious feelings of my huge sorrow. Give me your hands. From far off, methinks, I hear the beaten drum. Come, father, I'll bestow you with a friend. Scene 6. A tent and the fritch camp. Lear on a bed asleep. Soft music playing. Gentlemen and others attending. Enter Cordelia, Kent, and Doctor. Oh, thou good Kent, how shall I live and work to match thy goodness? My life will be too short and every measure fail me. To be acknowledged, madam, is or. All my reports go with the modest truth, no more nor clipped but so. Be better suited. These weeds are memories of those worser hours. I prithee put them off. Pardon me, dear madam. 
Yet to be known shortens my made intent. My boon I make it that you know me not till time and I think meet. And be it so, my good lord. How does the king? Madam, he sleeps still. Oh, you kind gods. Cure this great breach in his abused nature. The untuned and jarring senses, oh, wind up of this child-changed father. So please, your majesty, that we may wake the king. He hath slept long. Be governed by your knowledge, and proceed in the sway of your own will. Is he arrayed? Aye, madam. In the heaviness of his sleep, we put fresh garments on him. Be by, good madam. When we do awake him, I doubt not his temperance. Very well. Please you, draw near. Oh, my dear father. Restoration, hang thy medicine on my lips, and let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Kind and dear princess. Had you not been their father, these white flakes had challenged pity of them. Was this a face to be opposed against the warring winds? To stand against the deep, dread-bolted thunder. Mine enemy's dog, though he had bit me, should have stayed that night against my fire. And wast thou fain, poor father, to hovel thee with swine and rogues forlorn in short and musty straw? Alack! Alack, tis wonder that thy life and wits at once had not concluded all. He wakes. Speak to him. Madam, do you, tis fittest. How does my royal lord? How fares your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss. But I am bound upon a wheel of fire. And mine own tears to scold like molten lead. Sir, do you know me? You are a spirit, I know. When did you die? Still, still far wide? He scarce awake, let him lone a while. Where have I been? Where am I? Fair daylight. Oh, I'm mightily abused. She and die with pity to see another thus. I know not what to say. I won't swear these, these are my hands. Let's see. I feel this pinprick. But I were assured of my condition. Oh, look upon me, sir, and hold your hands in benediction o'er me. No, sir, you must not kneel. I do not want me. I am very foolish, fond of old man, fourscore and upward. Not now, or more, nor less. And to deal plainly, I, I fear I'm not in perfect mind. Methinks I should know you. I know this man. If I'm doubtful, for I am mainly. Ignorant. What, what place is this? No, I know not. Well, where, where, where did I lodge last night? <laughs> Laugh at me. As I'm a man, I think this lady... Child could be, yeah. And so I am. It is I right. am. Faith. I pray. Weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. You know you do not love me. Your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause they have not. No cause, no cause. No France. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Be comforted, good madam. The great rage you see is killed in him. It is danger to make him even, or the time he has lost, desire him to go in. Trouble him no more till further settling. 
Would please your highness walk? You must bear with me, pray. Pray you not forget and forgive. I'm old and foolish. Tis time to look about. The powers of the kingdom approach apace. The arbitrant is like to be bloody. Uh, fare you well, sir. My point and period will be truly wrought, or well or ill, as this day's battles fought. Act 5, Scene 1, The British Camp Near Dover. Enter with drum and colors, Edmund, Regan, and soldiers. Know of the Duke if his last purpose hold, of whether, since he is advised by aughts to change the course, he's full of alteration and self-reproving, bring his constant pleasure. Our sister's man is certainly miscarried. It is to be doubted, madam. Now, sweet lord, you know the goodness I intend upon you. Tell me but truly, but then speak the truth. Do you not love my sister? In honor it love. But have you never found my brother's way to the forfended place? No, by my honor, madam. I never shall endure her. Dear my lord, be not familiar with her. Fear me not. She and the Duke, her husband. I had rather lose the battle than that sister should loosen me and him. Our very loving sister, well be met. Sir, this I hear. The king has come to his daughter, with others whom the rigor of our state forced to cry out. Where I could not be honest, I never yet was valiant. For this business it toucheth us as France invades our land, not holds the king, with others whom I fear, most just and heavy causes make oppose. Sir, you speak nobly. Why is this reasoned? Combined together against the enemy, for these domestic and particular broils are not the question here. Let's then determine with the ancient of war on our proceedings. I shall attend you presently at your tent. Sister, you'll go with us? No. Tis most convenient. Pray you go with us. Oh, oh, I know the riddle. I will go. Fair your grace had speech with man so poor, hear me one word. I'll overtake you, speak. Before you fight the battle, hope this letter. If you have victory, let the trumpet sound for him that brought it. Wretched though I seem, I can produce a champion that will prove what is avouched here. Fortune love you. When time shall serve, let but the herald cry, and I'll appear again. I fare thee well. Our Lord look thy paper. The enemy is in view. Draw up your powers. We will greet the time. To both these sisters have I sworn my love, each jealous of the other, as the stung are of the adder. Which of them shall I take? Both. One. Or neither. Neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. To take the widow exasperates, makes mad her sister Goneril, and hardly shall I carry out my side, her husband being alive. Let her who would be rid of him devise his speedy taking off. As for the mercy which he intends to Lear and to Cordelia. The battle done and they within our power shall never see his pardon. For my state stands on me to defend. 
not to debate. Scene two, a field between the two camps. Alarm within, enter with drum and colors, King Lear, Cordelia, and soldiers over the stage. And exunt, enter Edgar and Gloucester. Here, Father, take the shadow of this tree for your good host. Pray that the right may thrive. If I ever return to you again, I'll bring you comfort. Grace go with you, sir. Alarm and retreat within. Re-enter Edgar. Away, old Wait. man. Give me thy hand. Away. King Lear hath lost he and his daughter Tain. Give me thy hand. Come on. No father, sir. A man may rot even here. What? In ill thoughts again. Men must endure their going hence, even as they're coming hither. Rightness is all. Come on. And that's true, too. Scene three, the British camp near Dover. Enter in conquest with drumming colors, Edmund, King Lear, and Cordelia. Prisoners, first captain. Some um, officers take them away. Good guard, until their greater pleasures first be known that are to censure them. We are not the first who with best meaning have incurred the worst. For thee, oppressed king, am I cast down. Myself could else outfrown false fortune's frown. Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters? No, 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 come. Let's away to prison. We two alone will seem like birds in a cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down. Now thee forgiveness, so we'll live. And pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh. Gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news and, and and we'll talk with them too. Who loses and who wins? Who's in? Who's out? Take upon the mystery of things as, as if we were God's spies. Take them away. He, he that parts us shall bring a brand from heaven and fire us hence like foxes. Wipe thine eyes, the good years shall devour them, to flesh and, and fell air, ere they shall make us weep. We'll see him starve first. Come. Come hither, Captain. Clark, take this note. Go follow them to prison. One step I have advanced thee. If thou dost, as this instructs thee, thou dost make thy way to noble fortunes. I'll do it, my lord. About it. And right happy when thou hast done. I cannot draw a cart, nor eat dried oats. If it be a man's work, I'll do it. Sir, you have shown today your valiant strain, and fortune led you well. You have the captives that were the opposites of this day's strife. We do require them of you. Sir, I thought it fit to send the old and miserable king to some retention and appointed guard. With him I sent the queen, and they are ready tomorrow, or at further space to appear while you shall hold your session. Sir, by your patience, I hold you but a subject of this war, not as a brother. He led our powers, bore the commission of my place and person, the which immediacy may well stand up and call itself your brother. Not so hot. In his own grace he doth exalt himself more than in your addition. In my rights, by me invested, he compares the best. That were the most, if he should husband you. A lady, I am not well, else I should answer from a full-flowing stomach. Mm. General, take thou my soldiers, prisoners, patrimony. Dispose of them, of me. The walls are thine. Witness the world that I create thee here, my lord and master. Mean you to enjoy him? The let alone lies not in your good will. Nor in thine, lord. Let the drum strike and prove my title thine. But stay yet. 
hear reason. Edmund, I arrest thee on capital treason, and in thine attaint this gilded serpent, for your claim, fair sister, I bar it in the interest of my wife. Tis she is subcontracted to this lord, and I, her husband, contradict your bands. If you will marry, make your loves to me. My lady is bespoke. An interlude. Thou art armed, Gloucester. Let the trumpet sound. If none appear to prove upon thy head thy heinous, manifest, and many treasons, there is my pledge. I'll prove it on thy heart, ere I taste bread. Thou art in nothing less than I have here proclaimed thee. Sick, oh, sick. Not how near trust medicine. There's my exchange. What in the world he is that names me a traitor? Villain like he lies. A herald, ho! My sickness grows upon me. She is not well. Convey her to my tent. Come hither, Herald. Let the trumpet sound and read out this. Sound trumpet! If any man of quality or degree within the lists of the army will maintain upon Edmond, supposed Earl of Gloucester, that he is a manifold traitor. Let him appear by the sound of the third sound of the trumpet. He is bold in his defense. Sound. Again. Again. What are you, your name, your quality, and why you answer this present summons? No, my name is lost by treason's tooth, bare non and canker bit. Yet I am noble as the adversary I come to cope. Which is that adversary? What's he that speaks for Edmund, Earl of Gloucester? Himself. What sayest thou to him? Draw thy sword, that if my speech offend a noble heart, thy arm may do thee justice. Here is mine. Behold, it is the privilege of mine honors, my oath, and my profession. Thou art a traitor, false to thy gods, thy brother, and thy father, conspirate against this high illustrious prince. Back. Do I toss these treasons to thy head with the hell hated lie or whelm thy heart? This sword of mine shall give them instant way where they shall rest forever. Trumpets speak! <laughs> Alarms, they fight, Edmund falls. Save him. This is practice, Gloucester. By the law of arms, thou wast not bound to answer an unknown opposite. Thou art van not vanquished, but cousined and beguiled. Shut your mouth, dame, or with this paper shall I stop it. Hold, sir. Thou worse than any name, read thine own evil. No tearing, lady. I perceive you know it. Say, if I do, the laws are mine, not thine. Who can arraign me for it? Knowst thou the paper? Ask me not what I know. Go after her. She's desperate. Govern her. What you have charged me with? <laughs> that I have done. And more. Much more. The time will bring it out. Tis past, and so am I. But what art thou? that hast this fortune on me? If thou art noble, I do forgive thee. Let's exchange charity. I am no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou hast wronged me. 
My name is Edgar, and thy father's son. The gods are just, and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. The dark and vicious place where thee got him cost him his eyes. Thou hast spoken right. Tis true. The wheel has come full circle. I am here. Methought thy very gate did prophesy a royal nobleness. I must embrace thee, let sorrow split my heart, if ever I did hate thee or our father. Worthy prince, I know it. Wherefore have you hid yourself? How have you known the miseries of your father? By nursing them, my lord. List a brief tale, and when tis told, oh, that my heart would burst. The bloody pro proclamation to escape that followed me so near taught me to shift into a madman's rags. And in this habit met I, my father, became his guide, led him, begged for him, saved him from despair. Never, no fault, revealed myself unto him until some half hour passed when I was armed. I asked his blessing and from first to last told him my pilgrimage. But his flawed heart, alack, too weak, the conflict to support, took two extremes of passion, joy, and grief, burst smilingly. This speech of yours hath moved me, and shall perchance do good. Help, help, oh help! What kind of help? Speak, man! What means that bloody knife? It is hot. It smokes. It came even from the heart of... Oh, she's dead! Who dead? Speak, man! Your lady, sir, your lady and her sister by her is poisoned. She hath confessed it. I was contracted to them both. All three now marry in an instant. Produce their bodies, be they alive or dead. This judgment of the heavens that makes us tremble touches us not with pity. I am come to bid my king and master I good night. Is he not here? Great thing of us forgot. Uh, speak, Edmund, where's the king? And where's Cordelia? Uh, seest thou this object, Kent? The bodies of Goneril and Regan are brought in. Alack. Why thus? Yet Edmund was beloved. The one the other poisoned for my sake after she slew herself. Even so. Cover their faces. I pant for life. Some good I mean to do despite of mine own nature. Uh, quickly, send be brief in it to the castle, for my writ is on the life of Lear and on Cordelia. They sent in time! Haste thee for thy life! He hath commissioned from thy wife and me to hang Cordelia in the prison and to lay the blame upon her own despair! The gods defend her! Bear him hence a while. Howl, 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 oh, oh, your men of stones, had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack, it's gone forever. I know when one is dead, and when one lives, she's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass, if that her breath would mist or stain the stone white. Then she lives. Is this the promised end? Image of that horror. Fall and cease. Her feathers stir. She lives. If it be so, it is a chance which does not 
which does redeem all sorrows that ever I have felt. Oh, my good master. Pity away. This noble Kent, your friend. A plague upon you, murderers, traitors all. I might have saved her. Now, she's gone forever. Good Delia. Good Delia, stay a little. Ha! Ah, what is it thou sayest? Her voice was ever soft, gentle, low, an excellent thing in woman. I killed the man that was a hanging thee. It is true, my lords, he did. Who are you? Man, that's not the best. I, 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 I'll tell you straight. A fortune brag of two she loved and hated. One of them we behold. This is a dull sight. And not you, Kent. The same. Your servant, Kent. Where is your servant, Caius? He's a good fellow, I can tell you that. He'll strike and quickly too, he's dead. Rotten. No, my good lord. I am the very man that, from your first of difference and decay, hath followed your sad steps. You're welcome hither. Nor no man else. All's cheerless, dark and deadly. Your eldest daughters have fordone themselves and desperately are dead. I, so I think. He knows not what he says. In vain it is that we present us to him. Edmund is dead, my lord. That's but a trifle here. Ye lords and noble friends, know our intent. What comfort to this great decay may come shall be applied. For us, we will resign during the life of this old majesty to him our absolute power. You to your rights. All friends shall taste the wages of their virtue and all foes the cup of their deservings. Hussein, see. And my poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life? And thou no breath at all. Now come no more. Never, 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 never. Pray you. I'll do this, but thanks, sir. You see this? Look at her. Look at her lips. Look there, look. Dies. Faints. My lord, my lord. Break, heart. I prithee break. Look up, my lord. Vex not his ghost. Oh, let him pass. He hates him much that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. He is gone indeed. The wonder is, he hath endured so long, he but usurped his life. Bear them from hence. Our present business is general woe. Friends, of my soul, you twain rule in this realm, and the gored state sustain. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much nor live so long. Exeunt with a death march. <laughs>